Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you on this Go Global Sunday, and we're going to share a little bit more about that uh, later in our gathering. We're looking this fall at um, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, the church that he planted about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And our focus today is, uh, in chapter 12, is the body of Christ. Now, just to remind ourselves of where we've been, one of the biggest threats to the Corinthian church, as we've seen throughout this series, is the division and disagreements that are threatening the unity of the church. For example, we saw, going back to the beginning of this letter, how um, after Paul left Corinth, he was there for about a year and a half, he planted the church. When he left, uh, a guy, a new leader named Apollos came along, and uh, he was teaching and leading and preaching, and there were some in the church that were really drawn uh, to Apollos, and there were others that were more drawn to Paul. And it created this sort of division of loyalties, and, and, and it almost led to a cult of personalities. Factions were forming in the church. And pretty soon, uh, they weren't just taking sides over who their favorite pastor or preacher or leader was. They began to take sides on all kinds of things, moral behaviors, what's okay for, for a Christian to do, theology. They're fighting over theological matters, which is why Paul's number one appeal to the church in Corinth is unity. Guys, we got to stop. We got to figure out how to stop fighting with each other in here because there is too much work to do out there, too much injustice and violence and oppression and, 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 and too much opportunity for us to make an impact to continue wasting our time going after each other in the church. Think for a moment how fragile this newly formed Christian community in Corinth was, partly because it was so new, but also because it was so different and contrary to any other organization or movement in the Roman world. It was ethnically and socioeconomically diverse, rich and poor, landowner and slaves, people of noble birth, worshiping and sitting in church alongside those born with nothing. So how do we hold together this radical countercultural community? And so Paul, in our text today, he uses this image of the body of Christ. It's one of those phrases that we hear a lot in church. We probably use a lot. Uh, sometimes we use it, though, without thinking about what it really means. It's a fascinating uh, image to be called the body of Christ. So we're going to look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you have a Bible. Uh, we're going to start our reading in verse 12, or you can follow along on the screens. We'll start in verse 12. Here's what Paul writes. For just as the body is one and has many members or parts, uh, the ESV translation uses members, NIV uses parts, and all the members of the body, though many are one, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. And then if you get on to verse 15, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body either. If the whole body were an eye, which this, I just couldn't stop thinking about the giant eyeball statue in Dallas and just how creepy that is all week as I came to this text. Paul says, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, there, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. And then if we skip down to verse 21, he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. Then down to verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We're going to come back to that verse, real important words. And then in verse 27, he says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And finally, if you skip to the very last verse in chapter 12, Paul sort of wraps up this section and he sets us up for the great chapter on love that we're going to look at next week, 1 Corinthians 13. He says, and I will show you a still more excellent way. That's the way of love as part of the body of Christ. 
So, I've been trying to figure out all week a way to illustrate what Paul is trying to get at here as he talks about different parts of the body. And there is a part of me that wanted to do something that would make you think that I'm heady and theologically profound and nuanced as I do this. So um, here we go. Some of you may be familiar with a certain toy that has been around for a long time. I think it goes back, it was invented in 1954 by a guy named George Lerner. Uh, He thought it would be fun to take a potato and to stick these different pieces, these body parts into the potato so that it looked like a real person. And as a kid, you could go and you could decide where you wanted to put all the different body parts. And that's the fun. Like I want to put the ears here or the mouth here or mix it all up. And there's a mustache or different kinds of hats. And they gave a name to this toy. What was the name? Mr. Potato Head. Okay. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever owned or played with or purchased a Mr. Potato Head. So Mr. George Lerner is a wealthy man. It's actually a pretty funny story. Um, They started out at first and uh, you had to use your own potatoes, like real potatoes. It was BYO potato, but uh, there were a lot of complaints coming from parents about the rotten potato smell because kids would just keep on using the same potato over and over. So finally, they came up with the plastic Mr. Potato Head. Uh, These days, you can go online, and if you want to do this during the sermon, that's understandable, but you can find all kinds of accessories. There are Mr. Potato Head hot rods and boat trailers and um, just all kinds of stuff. They even have pets for Mr. Potato Head. You can get a potato dog, potato cat. I don't know why anyone would ever want a potato cat, but it's available. Um, I checked a little bit further into this, and there is indeed a Jesus Potato Head. Okay. Um, there's even a Star Wars version called uh, Mr. Darth Tater. Not making this up. In fact, one of our worship leaders was like, oh, I totally had a Darth Tater growing up. It was awesome. So I've been thinking about different parts of the body that Paul talks about. He says, you and I are like the body of Christ. And just like Mr. Potato Head, this body has eyes and ears and hands and feet. And each of these parts, Paul says, are indispensable. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is just talk about, talk through some of these parts of the body, almost as a vision, as a picture of what it means for you and me and for Highland Park to be the body of Christ and how we live and serve and love one another. And I want to talk in particular about these four things, eyes, ears, hands, and heart. Eyes, ears, hands, and heart. So we'll start with the eyes. As the body of Christ, we have been given eyes to see the world the way God sees it. Something happens when you become a part, when you're grafted into a community, a body like this. God begins to give you new eyes, a new vision for the world. You begin to see what He sees. You see that every life matters. Every person you run into or work, work out with or go to school with, even the ones you don't particularly like, that's a person who matters to God, even if God doesn't yet matter to them. And then you begin to see them not just for who they are, but for who they could be. You see them through the eyes of grace. You believe, you, you actually believe in an age of such chronic cynicism that, cha- that people can actually change and grow and be transformed we begin to see in people what they cannot yet see in themselves. You ever had someone like that in your life? When I was growing up, uh, I didn't go to church. I didn't know God. Um, I, I made a lot of mistakes. But then along the way, I encountered Jesus through a church, a body like this. Well, one day, the, um, the pastor of that church, a guy named Vic Pence, huge influence in my life, um, he invited me out to lunch. I didn't, I didn't know him in a personal way at that point, but uh, he just called me and said, do you want to have lunch? Now, I was a little nervous about why the senior pastor of the church wanted to meet with me, a high school senior. It's like, does he have a direct line with God that, and he knows all the you know, stuff that I've been doing and he wants to talk about it? I didn't know, but I went to the lunch because he's the senior pastor and we had this lunch and it was, it was wonderful. But at a certain point during the conversation, he said to me, Brian, I see gifts in you. And I wonder if you've ever thought about being a pastor. And I said, no, like literally, I have never 
thought of being a pastor before, but he saw something that I couldn't see. And he kept pursuing me, and we stayed in touch through the years and through college. And after college, I actually ended up living in his basement, sort of shadowing him as an intern for a year. And um, I don't know if I've ever told him this story, but um, I remember it so clearly. Early on Sunday mornings, um, I, would, uh, I would sneak up out of the basement, and I would, like at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I would get close to the stairway up to his study, and I would listen to Vic practice his sermons. And I remember praying, God, someday I would love to do that. There was a person in the body of Christ who saw me and made room for me to learn and fail and grow. That's what happens when we see people as God sees them. We see that every person matters. Every life can change. Everyone has a gift. Anyone can make an impact. And so we pray, God, give us your eyes to see the people, to see people and to see the world the way you see them. But then second, Being part of this body means we pray, God, give us ears. Am I doing that right, Wheeler? Give us ears to hear what you hear. And what God hears, what he always hears, are the cries of those in need. You read through the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, over and over again we're told God hears the cries of his people, the cries of those who suffer, the cries of injustice. More than 2,000 times in the Bible, the poor and the oppressed, they cry out to God and God always hears their cry. And so when you're connected into this body, you begin to hear in a new way. You hear about children whose bodies and souls are hungry in our city and around the world. Or you hear about women or little girls who aren't allowed to or cannot afford to go to school and it breaks your heart. You hear the cries of those who've been oppressed for far too long. Later this week, uh, we're hosting, and we've never done this before, but we're hosting uh, the annual gathering of the Iranian Bible Society here at HP Prez. Now, Iran is one of the hardest places in the world to be a Christian because of persecution and threats of violence. And uh, more and more, we as a church are hearing the cries of this persecuted part of God's church in Iran. And so we'll be meeting later this week uh, here in our church uh, to hear a vision for reaching into that country and, among other things, to bring one million Bibles into Iran over the next couple years. Because the body of Christ, as we're learning and we're going to see on this Go Global Sunday, is a worldwide body. And so we ask God, give us ears to hear. Now, for some of you, uh, you will hear about injustice. You'll hear the weak who are being preyed upon by those who abuse their power. And what's going to happen is it's going to make you mad. And you're going to want to do something and respond and bring justice. And that's a good thing. But see, that emotion of righteous anger, if it is a gift from God, it will always lead toward compassion. It will never stay angry because we're the body of Christ. We're grafted into a God whose love always trumps anger. Because love, as Paul said, love is the more excellent way. Notice in verse 26 how he says, If one part suffers, the whole body suffers with it. Now, one of the ways that we can suffer with and alongside other people in the body of Christ, one of the most powerful ways to do that is through prayer. It's through prayer. And if anything is true of this church, and there are plenty of things that we don't always get right as a church, but this is a place where people pray. It's a church that prays. I was just looking over like a normal week here at Highland Park, all the gatherings where people come together, often unseen and hidden, to pray. For those who are struggling or suffering, so just to name a few, on Wednesday mornings, our elders and deacons come together for a a prayer breakfast where they go through and pray by name for every person they know of that's sick or suffering or grieving in our church. We have a group that prays for families who are dealing with infertility. Every morning at 845, our staff gathers on the third floor of this building to pray for you as a church, and I will tell you that pattern of beginning our day in prayer together, it's changing our hearts and even the culture of our staff. Every Sunday morning, there's a prayer meeting before any of our worship services where people, it's mostly women, and they've done this for years, and they come together and they pray protection over our worship services and our family of churches. And if you want to 
If like, if you want to be invited into deeper, a uh, deeper prayer life, come and pray with the likes of Betty Story and uh, Magic Ann Smith. And, and, and as they pray, it's like the chandeliers sometimes flicker. It's just mountain moving stuff. Day school parents who go on prayer walks around our campus praying over the next generation. There's a gathering called Teach Me to Pray, about a hundred people that meet an unfinished space on the third floor of this building, and weekly they're coming together to, 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 to claim the spiritual authority God has given us to boldly pray for healing and change, or prayer services where we lay hands on and anoint sick people with oil as the elders of the church come around them. Then there's the prayer room right off of our wind chapel, and for decades now, people have been praying all day, every day, hour after hour for the needs of this church. Sometimes I'll be driving down McFarland Boulevard uh, late at night or early in the morning, and I'll see the lamp on in the window of that prayer room, and it's like this little reminder that somebody is keeping watch in prayer. I am so grateful to be a part of this house because when Jesus talked about the kind of house that understood his heart, he said, this will be a house of prayer. So, eyes to see the world as God sees them, ears to hear what he hears, and then going back to Mr. Potato Head here, third, we have hands that are willing to respond. I think that's the wrong side. Let's go over here. Hands that serve, that awaken as God awakens us to his great mission in the world. We cannot be the body of Christ unless we're willing to reach out with our hands. On this Go Global Sunday, it's kind of an invitation for all of us to reach out in some small way, to get in the game, to serve. This may involve encouraging or uh, befriending one of our missionaries around the world or learning about new partnerships where we can come alongside Christians around the world or even helping out with refugees right here in our city as I know so many of you have done for years or going on one of our mission trips. Now that being said, it does not have to be something that you have to go on a trip across the world to do. It can start with everyday life, the people you work with or go to school with, I was talking uh, recently with a guy in the church who owns a small business, and he's real quiet about the impact that he has made, that he makes, but one of the ways that he serves his employees is by helping people go to college. A lot of folks who work for him end up being the first person in their family to get a college degree. He encourages them. He invites them to take that step. He supports them financially. Sometimes he'll help them get a, a driver's license so that they can drive to school. It's like God has given him eyes to see people who matter to God. He hears of a need and he serves. So be thinking about that today. Uh, Go to the picnic, the lunch on the lawn right after this service. Meet our outreach team, our mission team. Hear stories. Learn more what God is doing here. And then ask yourself, what's one small way that I or that our family can extend our hands to serve? Eyes, ears, hands, And then lastly, and this is the one I've had the hardest time with, though, feet. Now, using our feet means we actually have to go somewhere. At the very end of the Gospels, Jesus leaves his disciples with this final word, and we call this the Great Commission, where he says, go and make disciples. He doesn't say, I want you to form a committee or a task force or a Bible study to talk about the idea of going. He says, go, get on your feet and go. And as simple as that is, for some reason, we just get this mixed up. It gets lost in all the church stuff we do. But Jesus didn't call the world to go to church. He calls the church to go to the world. And so to do that, as we go into our cities and our schools and our neighborhoods and our workplaces so that people out there can know that there is a God who loves them enough to die for them, as we do that, it means we have to change the address of church. It is not 3821 University Boulevard. It's not a building. It's not an Elliott Hall or a sanctuary or a campus. The church, the body of Christ, is wherever Jesus is sending his people to be his hands and feet. There's this incredible image that the prophet Isaiah uses about this, and uh, we've looked at this before. Stirring words. The prophet says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. How beautiful are the feet of a messenger announcing good news. Back then, uh, feet weren't considered a beautiful part of the body. You have to think nomadic 
desert living people. And that day, a lot of people who didn't have shoes. But Isaiah says, how beautiful are the feet, feet that bring good news. So let me ask you a question. How beautiful are your feet? Think about the people in your life, your colleagues at work, your family, your kids. Would they say that your feet are beautiful? That in the way you live your life, you're bearing a message of good news. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. And let me just say, before you start feeling guilty, because I, I just, it's like scanning through the events of yesterday and all the ways and the moments and the times with my kids and then coaching lacrosse and everything going on that I was so not a beautiful feet messenger of good news. And so along the way, we're going to need to extend grace and patience in this because this kind of transformation as part of the body of Christ is not going to happen overnight. I'll give you an example. A while back, I had to catch an early flight uh, to go and speak at a funeral. And because it was a tight window, I had to wear my suit on the plane, which I almost never do. Like I can't can't remember the last time I traveled in a suit. Uh, I took the first flight out, so it was like 6 a.m., And um, because it was so early, as soon as we took off, I started nodding off, falling asleep, as I often do on planes, until the lady sitting next to me on the plane spilled her coffee on me. What's worse is that she did not acknowledge it or say anything about, or say sorry or anything, like no acknowledgement of the coffee all over my suit. I'm just sitting there stewing on this, even playing out in my mind what I might have said if I were not a pastor. You know, lady, that coffee you spilled on me was pretty hot, but it's not as hot as hell, and that's where people go who don't apologize. (laughs) Now, I didn't say that. I mean, I had the thought, but but that would not have been a beautiful feat moment, and so I need grace, and you need grace because the work that God is doing to shape us into a body of Christ that reflects his love, his grace, his patience, his kindness into the world. It doesn't happen overnight. Mostly it happens through abiding, remaining, just holding on, staying connected to the one who transforms us. Jesus, I need you. I cannot do this alone. Keep me connected to you. Keep me connected to your body. Eyes, ears, hands, feet. Every one of us is invited into this. No one's left out. By the way, one of the greatest gifts of this body here at Highland Park Prez is how God is calling together every generation, young and old, even in this room right now, to be this body of Christ together. To have this legacy of disciples in their 70s, 80s, and 90s who are serving and worshiping alongside a younger generation that's learning from them to follow in the way of Jesus. What an amazing picture of the body of Christ. And I am so thankful to be a part of this because I see a room full of people who are listening to the cries of those who need mercy. You see a need and you respond and you're the hands and feet, the beautiful feet that are bringing the good news evermore, this news of freedom to the the oppressed and food for the poor, a home for the homeless, hope for the hopeless, healing for communities and families and marriages. And at the center of all this, it has always been the center of everything we do, is Jesus. The one who on the cross showed us the more excellent way. Because the most beautiful feet are the ones that walk that path to Calvary. They're the hands that bear the scars of of, of our sins as they nailed him to the cross. Ears that heard all the taunts and the shouting and the mocking and the angry crowds. And yet he chose to forgive those who condemned him to death. Eyes that saw the thief crucified at his side and showed mercy and said, today you will be with me in paradise. He has shown us a more excellent way, crucified love. So may we take up his cross and follow him as his body broken and poured out in love for the world. So Jesus, would you do that good work in our lives today? Even as we continue in worship, Bind us together as one body of Christ in your image. In Jesus' name, amen.